All right, we got your Bibles. Turn to Psalm chapter 43 and verse number uh, 5. Psalm chapter 43 and verse number 5. And I'll get into it tonight. Man, I feel the presence of God in here tonight. And may the Lord speak to you in a mighty way. May your heart be open to what God would have for you. Um, Man, you know, you talked about videotaping our wedding. And man, it brought back so many memories. My wife and I, we got engaged on the 4th of July. And... uh, just saying that, I don't know why, it just brought back a lot of good memories, and my wife and I watching the video, and uh, I appreciate Tom, Brother McMurtry. You got a good pastor. Amen. Listen, I'm going to say that again. You got a good pastor. Amen. I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> you didn't pay me to say this, but you do. You do. You got a good man. And, uh, you know, you see, you see men, and they're good men, but you see good men falling anymore. And there's a good man standing behind this pulpit, preaching the Word of God, faithful to you, faithful. I'm telling you what, you need every once in a while, write him a thank you card. Say, I appreciate you, Pastor. You're the man. <laughs> Do something like that. You know how to encourage your preacher? I never really realized how much thank you notes meant a lot until uh, I, was really, I was really down. I got down, and I know it doesn't happen to anybody else but me. I got down and I was at my desk and uh, I knocked over a paper and right underneath that paper was a, a note a teen girl had wrote to me. And she said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That is a big encouragement to me, this verse. And I just want you to know, Brother Nick, you're a blessing to me. And may this verse be an encouragement to you. And that was about the whole thing. But you know what? Seeing that note just got me so excited. I was like, man, I can do this. And the funny thing is, I took that note and I slid it under some papers and I, you know, kind of forgot about it for a few months. And I got down again. I know, it happened again. And I turned over some papers and there was that note again. God used that note not once, but twice. And how long does it take to write a thank you note? Or an encouraging note? Or, you know, preacher, you're the man. Or to have a little kid write a picture. You know, we, have, we run uh, bus routes and a young girl on our bus route, she drew a picture of me. And I had a jet pack on my back, and I was flying in the air, and I was saying her name, and there was a picture of Central Baptist Church, and my bus captain, the guy that helps me on the buses, he had like this crazy Lego, you know the Lego heads hairdo? He had like this Lego head hairdo on his head. He's like, what's going on? And I don't know, it was just, it was encouraging that a young girl would take the time to draw a picture like that for me. I don't know. I'm just. I don't know where it came from. It's not in my message. Like I said, he didn't pay me to say that. But man, just be a blessing to the man of God. Be a blessing to the man of God. You know what it'd be. God, you know God will bless you for that. Anyways, get in the message. Psalm 43. Psalm 43, verse number five. I'm gonna be preaching facing giants in your life, and uh, I will get in a little bit about David. We know David and Goliath. We know the giant there, and uh, we know that foundational uh, story. Been taught it probably in Sunday school, and I love that. Amen. I love the little guy taking on the big guy. Amen. I always like that. If there's going to be a fight and there's a little guy and a big guy, I want the little guy to win, man. Amen. So, but anyways, Psalm 30, 43, 5. It says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise Him. Who is the health... Listen to this. The health... Listen to this, who is the health of my countenance and my God. I'm just a person that gets down. I'm just a depressed person. You don't understand. Let's read this again. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, who is the health of my countenance. What do people see when they look at you? If you spend time with God, you'll have a healthy countenance. Amen? It says it right there. Moving on. Uh, 42. Let's go to Psalm 42 and verse number 5. Psalm 42 and verse number 5. It says... Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise Him. Look at this. For the help of His countenance. You know, as I, I got saved later on in life, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up as a, as a Catholic boy. I was lost. And I remember as I uh, got saved and I started seeing preachers come in, it would seem like some of the preachers' faces would just kind of shine or glow. And I got to thinking about that after a while, and I kind of figured it out it was this. They spent a lot of time with God, amen? amen. 
They spend a lot of time with God. They're always happy. They're always jolly. Now, before the message, it looked like they're going to beat somebody up. But uh, until then, man, they were shaking hands. They were talking to people. And they were excited. They're excited about life. And you wouldn't know that just a few minutes ago, someone could have said whatever to them. And I got to thinking about it. And you, you know the crazy part is, you may never know what happened to your preacher 10 minutes before he got in the pulpit. You don't know what call someone called and spoke to him about right before he got up there. But if the man of God is spending time with God, that man of God can get in this pulpit and can preach. And you'll never know the difference. And outside of the preacher, we, you as the members of this church can be the same exact way. When bad things go wrong, doesn't mean we should tuck our tails down and cry in our cereal or our Cheerios or our Fruit Loops or whatever brand you may eat. Amen. But we can get our help from God and get our strength from God and we can, God can pick us back up and we can keep going. I remember learning that principle young. I got saved at a boys home. It was like a military school and it was a faith-based organization. Uh, I, uh, I was such a good kid, my mom sent me to a, a boarding school, amen? And uh, she just loved me so much. And hey, some of you kids in here, you watch those shows and you see all those kids in that boarding school and you say, never happened. That was me. Better watch out. No, okay. <laughs> but anyways, I get there and I get saved and there was a man, his name is Ray Ortiz. And Ray had got some really bad news on the phone and we would only get like one phone call every month or it was one phone call every two weeks. And it's only 10 minutes. So he got this 10 minute phone call and no doubt he was thinking about his family and he had received some bad news from home. You ever been a distance away from your family and you hear bad news? That's like the worst, right? You're so far away and you're, you ever, you ever been on vacation or maybe you're apart for some reason and you're trying to figure out what's going on? I know as a dad or, or maybe the wife, you know, you're away and dad's with the kids. The wife is always calling. Are they okay? Are they surviving? Right? <laughs> Did you give them a bath? Yes. She's in the tub. She's one years old. Are you there with her? I'll be there in a little bit. <laughs> okay. You know, mom is wondering what's going on. But anyways, he was a distance apart. He lived in Missouri and his family lived, uh, I believe, in California. I mean, that's a distance, amen. And he got bad news. And I took note of it because he was an established Christian longer than me. And I watched how he dealt with the bad news. You know, sometimes we don't always understand, but there's always someone that's watching us. And I think the best time to teach somebody is in the worst circumstances of life because our true character will shine. Circumstances should not dictate how we react. We should react by principle. And I've seen him receive those, that bad news, and immediately after, he just got down, knelt down, and he started praying. And a few minutes later, he got back up and he had a smile on his face. And he kept going. You know what I learned a lot from that? You say, well, what would you learn? I learned this, that the health of my countenance is in God. That with God, I can get help. You can tell man all your problems. You can tell man all your troubles. You can give man all your problems. But man, really, can I be honest with you? It doesn't care. Are you with me? I'm being honest with you. I'm not, I'm not trying to just, yeah, we really, yeah, he cares, but you want to know what? He doesn't really care like God does. Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, casting all your care, your worries, your anxieties, the thing that keeps you up at night. You talked about a lady with gout, that pain that she has in her body that she probably will tell you about if you ask her because it's agonizing pain. Believe me, when you're in pain and somebody asks you, it's hard not to say something, amen. You're like, they told me, I'm going to let it go, amen. But if you bring that pain, that hurt, that trial, that trouble to God, can I say this? God made us. God formed us. God knows everything about us. He knows we're weird. (laughs) And He loves us anyways, doesn't He? (laughs) He made us that way. God, if I'm weird, you did it. Amen. <laughs> right? Amen. 
You share it with God. You open your heart before God. I, I was talking to somebody, I was counting to somebody recently, and I said, the reason you can't do that is because you don't trust God enough. You've got to trust God. You've got to come to a place. How many times do you read through the book of Psalms as David comes to a point where Saul is chasing his life or something's happening in his life and he just goes, God, and he cries out to God and he gives God everything. And he, God lifts him back up. Amen. Proverbs 18, 14 says this, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear Tonight I'm going to first talk on my first point. I've talked a lot about it already, so I may just move on. But the giant of depression and despair. Let's pray, God, I need your power. God, I need your touch. I can't do this without you, God. God, I pray you'd help somebody tonight, God. I pray that you'd use me, God. I can't do this without you. God, I pray that if somebody's not saved in here tonight, God, that they'd get saved. God, I pray that they put off the decision of not getting saved and would get saved. Pray if there's one tonight, God, that is facing giants and is getting beaten down, that tonight, God, they come and they get the victory. God wants to say we love, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we need to remember that God is always there. He always cares. He's always listening. He always wants to help. I love this. You go to a therapist and he sits down and he listens. Okay. Uh, he says, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll see you next week. And what did he really do for you? Listen, I went to, I've been to many counselors, I've been to many people, I had problems as I grew up, I still have problems, amen, <laughs> they don't ever go away, but can I tell you something, when I go to God with my problems, they're always resolved, and if they're not resolved, if I don't have an answer, I can trust that eventually I will get the answer, or He'll take care of it, amen. I don't know if you feel down, I don't know if you feel downhearted today, but I know the one that can help you. I like this. God says this, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. When we get born again, this is good. The Holy Spirit of God comes in. I'm going to tell you something about that person that moves in. He's awesome, amen. amen. If you give him the time of day. You know, I, I think so many times we, we spend time not talking about the Holy Spirit because we're afraid that we don't give him enough uh, attention. It's like your wife. You don't give her enough attention. What happens? It's not good. <laughs> there we go. The Holy Spirit of God is sensitive. He wants you. When's the last time you got alone, got in the book, and you said, you know what? I'm hurting. Holy Spirit of God, would you help me? It says, and when I go, I will not leave you comfortless, but I'll send a comforter who shall be with you, which is the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. We have a comforter. You have somebody that comforts you. You don't have to have somebody going, it's okay. It's okay. Five more minutes. It's okay. <laughs> All right. You can go to God, spend as much time as you want. By the way, He desires that. He wants that. He wants us to come to Him. I love that. Romans 8, 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Remember the Spirit of God. And look, sometimes, you know what, our prayers won't get answered the way we think they will. Dear God, give me a million dollars. Lord, I will tithe every cent of it. But I want a million dollars. How many prayed that? <laughs> Amen. And the answer does not come. Does it mean that God's bad? No. No. God may know what that money will do to you. Amen. But you pray and God will help you. His countenance, His touch, His lifting, His Holy Spirit. Hey, when's the last time that you felt the Spirit of God outside the church house in a quiet place where you melt down and you talk with God? Get along with God. Get along with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And spend some time and go get up until He lifts you up. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you what. It'll help you. I like this. I was uh, reading a story here and uh, about an evangelist who wrote the song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. His name is Charles Weigel. Weigel. How do you pronounce that, brother? Weigel. There you go. Music director helped me with that. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit about his story. If you don't know it, it's a good one. And how many know that song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus? So I'm going to read the story for you. So often tragedy and despair have led to the writing of some of the most inspiring hymns. This week's choice is such an example. Charles Weigel was an evangelist and songwriter. 
One day after preaching at a gospel crusade, he came home to find a note from his wife of many years. The note said that she did not care for the life she had led being an evangelist's wife and was leaving him. Wow. That's encouraging. The next few years were a time of despair for Weigel. He later said that he became so despondent that there were even times when he contemplated suicide. He even wondered if anyone really cared for him. After a time, his faith was again restored and he became an active for the Lord again. Can I say, probably not written in here, but there's probably a time when he got along with God and God gave him the restoration back in his soul. Amen. Because that comes from God. It doesn't come from peppy sermons. It doesn't come from positive thinking. It only comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is the one that's going to put that in your soul to get you to keep going. Amen. Because I'll tell you what, those peppy, those peppy words and all that goes away over time. But God is always there. During that time, he wanted to put out a paper, a song that would share his feelings and his experiencing during these days. From a heart that was broken came the words in this tune. Here, I'll read it for you. This man wrote this. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would love to tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed His strong and loving arms around me and He led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as He. No one else could take sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much He cares for me. Isn't that exciting? How the broken pieces of a life, the broken pieces of a marriage, what a devil destroyed, and God kind of picks it back up and God says, I can still use you, Charles. No doubt Charles is going, I'm an evangelist. That's what I do. That's like saying you're a mechanic and you have no hands. Are you with me? What do you do? Do you work on it with your feet? Right? What do you do, Charles? You're an evangelist. What do you do? Your wife's gone. What do you do? And he turned that and he wrote this song. And I wonder how many people were helped through the writing of this song. Instead of getting down, he got up. How did he get up? God picked him up. How did he do that? Because his countenance was restored by God. It's simple, is it not? But how many times do we do it? You know what we do? We tell this person, and we tell this person, and we tell that person. But we don't tell the very one that can help us, and that's God. Next giant I see. So we see the giant of depression and despair. The next giant I see is this, a giant of discouragement. If you'd go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 28. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 28. And at this time I'll tell a joke, all right? Give us a little bit of help here. Said this lady every morning she would walk uh, downtown. And as she walked downtown, she walked by uh, a pet store. And as she walked by the pet store, my teenagers know this one very well. As she walked by the pet store, there was a parrot in the window. And the lady would walk by the pet store and the parrot would look at her. She'd look at the parrot and the parrot would go, Wah, lady, you're ugly. She'd go, I never. And she'd stomp off and she'd walk to work. Next day, she walked by, parrot look at her. She'd look at the parrot parrot go, Wah, hey, lady, you're ugly. She said, that is it. And she went in there and she told that store owner, he better not say I'm ugly anymore. And the store owner said, that's bad English. No, the store owner said this. He said, he will not say you're ugly anymore. Next day, the lady came downtown, walked by the pet store window. That parrot looked at her. She looked at that parrot. The parrot goes, wah, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I like that one. That's, That's one of my favorites. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse number 28, and it says this, Whither shall we go up? Talking about going into the promised land. How many know that song, ten spot, uh, 12 men went to spy, and Cain and 10 were bad, and 2 were good? I don't know if you know that one. It's a good song. Memorize it's good. Well, the spies go out, amen. And there's 10 that are bad, and there's 2 that are good. And we get down here, it says, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren, what? No, our brethren, what? What did they do? Have discouraged our heart. We can't feel a pew. It's impossible anymore. Right? Yeah, we can. We can do that. God's just not working like He used to in the old days. 
I think it's still the same God. Our brethren have discouraged our heart. You always look for the negative. Why not find a positive? Yes, we can. There's giants. Their their biceps are as big as my head. Amen. All they have to do is boom and just crush me. Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great. They're walled all the way up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakims there, the giants. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. Why? What's the answer again? The Lord your God. Isn't it amazing? It always goes back to the Lord. And the very first thing that so many times leaves our lives is the Lord. We don't realize it. We realize it this way. One day you miss your Bible. One day you miss your prayer time. And then it turns into two days. And then it turns into three days. And then it turns into, oh, I messed up, so I need to get back at it. But that's what happens and discouragement sets in. And if you don't spend time with God, you don't get that encouragement. You don't get that touch from God that you need. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, He shall fight for you. Amen. He's got bigger boxing gloves than I do. Amen. He's stronger than I am. He can go to toe to toe with them better than I can, according to all He did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Listen, it's a sad story, but discouragement caused the children of Israel. Look at They got so close to the promised land. But because of discouragement, they weren't able to enter in. I don't want that. I don't want that on my tombstone. He was close, but he didn't make it. You know, it's like that guy running off that cliff and he thinks he can make that big jump. He's like, I'm almost, and then he just falls all the way to the bottom. I don't want to be that guy. Amen. That's not who I want to be. I want to be the guy that jumps and I almost miss, but then I get a hand on there, right? And I'm climbing up and I'm like, yeah, I made it. That's how I want to be. I don't want somebody to go, look at that other guy. He jumped and look, he's all the way down there. (laughs) Look at this guy, right? (laughs) Let's watch him fall on the rocks, right? (laughs) Isn't that what happens? When you attempt to do something great, there's always people that will try to discourage you. But they won't attempt to do it themselves. But they'll be right there to discourage you, won't they? need to forget them people. Remember God and say, God will give us the victory. God has promised us the victory. I want to be a victorious Christian. Listen, I, I want to see the high walls and the giant's land. I don't, I don't want to see that. I don't, these, look at these people. They saw the high walls. They saw the giants. But I want to see a big God to show Himself real in a big way. I don't see these walls. I see God. God can get over these walls. God can defeat those giants. See, either you're looking at the problem or you're looking at the solution. Amen. You work a job, you'll know the boss won't want you to tell you about all the problems. Your boss wants you to what? Find a solution. And if you're always going to him with the problems, before too long, he'll be like, why do I need you? <laughs> right? You're always telling me the sheet machine is broken down. Figure it out. Why am I paying you? Right? Isn't that what he says after a while? God's saying, listen, there's going to be problems, but I'm telling you, look for a solution. The solution is in me. Trust in me. God gives us big problems because He wants to show Himself real in a big way. And if all God did was give us little problems, how would we know that God could do great things? How could we? We could look in the Bible, but we would never experience them personally. Listen, I've got a personal relationship with God. That's the difference between me and the Catholicism. Listen, I personally know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Amen. He walks with me. He talks with me. He's there. He tells me I am His and He is mine. Amen. I'm excited about that. I hope you're excited about that. And I hope you understand that this relationship can cause you to have victory. Even though you're in a position that seems like you're about to cave in. Children of Israel, they're led out of Egypt, right? They're positioned, Egyptian army behind, the Red Sea before, and you would say strategically, they're going to crumble, right? They are no match for the Egyptian army, and they're going to drown in the sea. But what does God do? What do people talk about so many years later? 
They don't say, remember all those Israelites that died at the Red Sea? They say, remember all those Egyptians? Remember the parting of the Red Sea? Amen. So you have a problem in here tonight, and you're discouraged. Why not say this? Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, He it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Psalm 27 and verse number 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And He shall promise strength in thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 31, verse 24. Be of good courage. Courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Listen, how did David face a giant when all the great warriors were shaking in their boots? Are you with me? Come on, look at me. I mean, all these big guys. They'd come back from a battle, and David's like seven years old. David's like, hey, tell me about the battle. Tell me about the battle. They're like, yeah, we I took out like ten men. He's like, man, that guy's awesome. He's my hero. And he talked to this other guy. Now, fast forward a little bit. David's like, I don't know. Everybody's got their own age. Let's say 16, okay? <laughs> David goes down to the battle. He's bringing cheese. I like cheese. You like cheese? All right. It's, it's awesome. Cheese and crackers. And man, he probably had some beef jerky in there. He's like, man, this is great. And not the peppered stuff, because that's awful. And the sweet stuff with the good, the regular. He's like, I got beef jerky. I got cheese. And the guys are like, oh, what are we going to do? There's a giant. He's like... What's wrong with you, man? Didn't you, like, kill ten people by yourself? Come on, just take this guy on. Hey, aren't we in God's army? Right? Right? And no one steps up to the plate. No one faces the giant. David says, you know what? I'll take him, Mom. He's ugly anyways. I'm going to beat him in his ugly face. <laughs> right? And David steps out, a 16-year-old, with a runt. I don't think we picture the Bible, right? There's this massive guy. He's like, oh, I'm going to get you. And David's like, no, you're not, right? <laughs> and the guy's like, oh, ho, ho. I'm going to send you up in the falls of the air. going to eat you. He's like, no, my God's going to get you, <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden, this guy's walking up. You know, the ground shakes. And David's like, I'm going to get this down. And guy falls down dead, right? He's done. This little guy, he goes over, let me get the sword. <laughs> Cuts off the head. Takes his big old head. He's like dragging it. And all the people are like, what just happened? David slew a giant. How did that happen? And they know it wasn't David. Because he's just a little twerp. <laughs> right? How could David do that? David. But you know what happened in David's life? David had a lion, he had a bear, he had little problems. And see, these little problems, David had them in the right way. And so they built his faith. So when it came to a big giant, he had strong faith to take on a big giant. And when others would crumble around him, David stood up. And that's a blessing, is it not? And we still sing songs about David and Goliath. We tell our children, and it's awesome. My last one is this. We need to face the giant of disappointment. We need to face the giant of disappointment. I think the best example of this is the life of Joseph. Joseph is promised big dreams. He tells his brother, and I can attest to this, I was the youngest, and your brother's beat up on you. Amen. He's like, man, you all are going to bow down to me. How many have older brothers? You had older brothers, right? You're like, you're going to bow down to me, and they're like, you're bowing down to me right now, right? <laughs> Are you, you got enough? All right, now you can get up. David's like, look at this. He's like, look at my coat. It's North Face. Isn't this awesome? Dad bought this for me. Yeah, you didn't get any nice coats. Yeah, you got the Walmart brand, right? Right? And David's like walking around, and his brothers are just mad at him every day. And David's like, man, I had a dream. You are, I'm going to be like, you are, you ain't going to, you're going to be, I'm awesome. You're not, okay? And you know what happened? Sorry, Joseph. I'm saying David. I'm saying, you know what I'm talking about, though. Hey, Amen. <laughs> Thank you. That's what a good wife is for. So Joseph, so Joseph, there we go, Joseph. Joseph, dad goes out, hey, Joseph, 
Go check how your brother are doing. Okay, Dad. He goes and finds them. And what do they do? They throw them in a pit. And there was no water in that pit. I don't know how deep it was, but it's not like they're like, now, Joseph, we're going to lightly drop you into this pit, okay? Did you hurt yourself? Oh, we're sorry. You know what they did? They're like, boom! Yeah, I think I broke his leg, right? They were mean. They were ruthless. They did care nothing for their brother. And Joseph, no doubt, is in sludge and in nastiness in that pit. And you know what he's thinking? God promised me big dreams and I'm met in a pit. I'm in this pit and God said great things were going to happen. This is not working out like God told me it was. Right? So David, his brothers are like, you ever thought about how they got David out of the pit? Maybe like one person like held him and the other guy got him out. I think this is what they did. Now, this isn't like, all right, Bible, this is just my own thoughts. They're like, Hey, David, man, we're sorry we threw you in the pit. Listen, I'll tell you what. We'll tell you what. Dad's got beef jerky. Here, we'll pull you out. You get your own bag. All right? So they pull David out of the pit, and then they sell him into slavery. Right? And then he's lied about. He stands up for right, and he's lied about, and he's cast in the dungeon. Who in here is 13 years old? Anybody 13? Stand up. As old as this young man's alive, look at me. He went through just heartache and turmoil and disappointment after disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. And David's like, I still believe God. Sit down. Thank you. You get ice cream after this. <laughs> that was your only job. <laughs> Junior hires. <laughs> Man, you messed me up now. <laughs> After disappointment. But you know what he said? I still trust God. God promised me that He would do it. And it may not seem like I have the answer because of my circumstance. But I believe God. And what happened? One day, Pharaoh dreams a dream. He had Taco Bell before he went to bed. (laughs) And he dreams a dream. And no one can interpret. And they bring Joseph out. I just like to picture this. He shaves himself. He takes off his rags. Stands before Pharaoh. He says, I'm going to tell you, God gave me the interpretation. He interprets the dream. And Pharaoh takes off the ring from his hand and puts it on Joseph's hand. And he says, only here will you be. Will I be above you? You'll be second to me. And Joseph's like vice president, right? Of the land. And if you could just see Joseph as tears are streaming down his eyes and he's thinking, all this time, these 13 years, I've went through this 13 years. Disappointment. But I never didn't trust you, God. I trusted you through it all. And look where I'm at today. Giant of disappointment. High expectations met with reality brings disappointment, doesn't it? But if we just trust God and we take His promise and we say, you know what, God? You know what? I'm just going to trust You anyways. Things in life may not seem like they're working out like I thought they would, but I'm still going to trust You. I'm still going to trust You. I ask You to bow your head and close your eyes tonight.